as you know, Jeff Bingaman was, has been um, a senator for 30 years, uh, representing New Mexico. Uh, in, he at, was chairman of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. What's, what, for me, is a personal note is that uh, Jeff got his law degree from Stanford, but I had nothing to do with that, so that's not the personal note yet. <laughs> the personal note is that for, I don't know, 10 or 15 years now that I remember, Jeff would be come visiting Stanford multiple, one or two times a year, and we'd have these conversations that uh, he'd spend basically a day where he would talk with faculty members. He may have brought Bob Simon with him as chief of staff. And we would have deeply substantive conversations. It was sort of my image of what I used to believe all the senators were like. <laughs> I used to believe that. Uh, and, and so he's been just, uh, just a pleasure to have as part of the Stanford community. So with that bit of introduction, just have a, one or two questions for you, Jeff. All right. Uh, so how did you get into energy anyway? You're a lawyer. I mean, what does a lawyer have to do with energy? Well, I, I practiced law first in, in Santa Fe in a private firm, and, and uh, some of our uh, better paying clients were energy companies. Uh, I was practicing with a former governor, Jack Campbell, former governor of New Mexico. And uh, we represented some uh, folks in, in various parts of the energy industry at that time. Energy is a big part of New Mexico's economy, always has been. And so when I went to the Senate, I asked to go on the Energy Committee and was able to serve there for 30 years. So, so even at the beginning, I mean, you, you could have specialized in a lot of other things as a lawyer. Something brought you to the energy area, and, and, and it probably wasn't an accident that you're, the clients that you're dealing with, lawyer. do you have a prior interest in it, you know? Well, I, I, I think that, uh, I think I just grew up recognizing that energy was a very big part of the economy in our state, and uh, a very important determinant of, of uh, whether or not people had jobs, and so, uh, uh, I think that's what uh, sort of focused me on it. But, uh, but I do think that my early law practice probably had a, had a big part in it. Uh, I was Attorney General of New Mexico. And again, uh, that, that puts you into direct uh, 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 contact with a lot of energy-related issues. So, uh, so in, going to the, going to the uh, Senate, uh, I went there with the idea that energy was very important. We also, of course, have uh, two, two national laboratories in our state that uh, have substantial research, uh, research going on related to energy, both Los Alamos and Sandia, and uh, that, that was another factor. So, so you now are living in Santa Fe, but sort of commuting to Stanford. Uh, tell me about that. Um high carbon footprint world that you're in yeah, right now. Yeah, right. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm working with uh, Dan Riker and uh, others at the, uh, and Alicia, I see Alicia over here, uh, at the uh, Steyer Taylor Center there at the law school, and we are doing a joint project with, the, uh, with uh, uh, George Schultz and his uh, task force at the uh, Hoover Institution to try to look at state laws that uh, have been enacted over the last 25 or 30 years to try to uh, promote renewable energy, promote more efficiency, and, and see if we can identify some of those that have worked particularly well that we can urge uh, states to look at seriously and, uh, that, and, and perhaps some that haven't worked uh, that, that ought to be flagged as well. I, I'm delighted to hear that you and George Schultz are working together. That means a partisan dis divide of Washington, D.C. does not exist here. You're a Democrat, he's a Republican. We have, have uh, Democrats and Republicans around here, and we all seem to work together. 
But no, it's okay, I, right? It, it's easier. The further you get away from Washington, the easier it is to do that. <laughs> <laughs> now, I understand that your wife and son are both entrepreneurs. Something happened to you that right, you, right, you, you right. didn't follow that. Right. No, I'm, I'm the black sheep of the family. I did not uh, pursue a, a business career, but both my wife and, and son did. And uh, uh, they, my wife's now uh, largely retired, but uh, she had some very successful businesses. And, and, uh, and our son is now uh, doing very well in business as well. And she used to head the antitrust division of the Department of Justice. Pretty, right. pretty powerful position. Very powerful family. Well, her, her side of it definitely was. <laughs> right. I, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, what the president said, um, which is, as I said, it was, uh, you know, he, he, we told the White House, can you just get it the day before this event so it's news, but, you know, they didn't listen to us exactly. But I want to understand the, the implications of it. For a long time, Many people were saying there's one of two directions we can go in in the energy and climate policy. We can have legislation, and we had Waxman Markey and a whole range of, of, of legislative attempts, or we can have EPA. And for a while, we had neither. And now it looks like it's going to be a heavy EPA rule. rule. What does that say about is Congress then off the hook? Will they forget all about it? What's going, to, what's going to be the interaction between the president doing something in the EPA and, and the Congress thinking about these issues? Well, I do think the uh, <clears throat> circumstances change significantly from uh, when Lisa Jackson used to testify uh, to us there in the Congress, her, she would always start by saying her preference was that Congress would go ahead and legislate uh, limits on greenhouse gases and, and put in place a regime to, to control them. And of course, the President, in his State of the Union speech earlier this year and in, in previous State of the Union speeches, also urged the Congress to, I think he referred to it as uh, adopt uh, 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 market-based solutions to these climate problems. Uh, now he's concluded that that's not going to happen, uh, at least in this Congress, and so uh, he's directed EPA to go ahead. The further EPA goes down the road toward, toward finalizing, developing, and finalizing a rule, I think the less likely it is that Congress will uh, legislate in the area with the possible exception of a tax. Uh, I mean, we, we do have a lot of discussion and articles in the morning paper about uh, comprehensive tax reform. I, I personally don't think we're going to do comprehensive tax reform in this Congress, but one of these Congresses, we will do it. And as part of that, I think some kind of carbon tax uh, could be seriously considered. But uh, as far as a cap and trade proposal, I don't see Congress doing anything of that type. And uh, I think, as I say, the, the direction to EPA, which the president gave this week, uh, I think makes it less likely that Congress will try to enact anything of that type uh, in the foreseeable future. So it's interesting you mentioned the uh, uh, carbon tax, because many of us at Stanford, uh, including George Schultz, who you've been talking about, has been doing some analysis uh, looking at a revenue neutral uh, carbon tax, which, which in many of our views can't make it alone, but, but a tax system is so messed up that, that there should be some reform, whether it's comprehensive or not, that it could be rolled in. Uh, how probable would you, if you were to assess probabilities of first that, that, the, that within the next four years or so that, that they take on serious tax reform and then seriously roll, think about, at least uh, think about a carbon tax. You think it's somewhat likely, very likely, snowball's chance in hell well, it's, or what? It's hard, it's hard to predict over four years. So the planning horizon in Washington is two years. Uh, but, it's gotten longer. Yeah, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think it's very unlikely, or I'd say at least unlikely, that uh, any comprehensive tax reform will be accomplished in this Congress. 
after the next election, uh, it's, it's, it is possible that the president will determine it's a priority of his before he leaves office and that members of both Democrat and Republican uh, members of the Congress would, would determine its priority as well. Uh, I think some of the impetus for tax reform was, was uh, the uh, alarm about the growing deficit. And now that the deficit is no longer growing and is in fact shrinking, not the debt, but the deficit itself, uh, the, uh, some of the motivation for going on with uh, major tax reform is, is, uh, is less than it was. Interesting. Well, uh, I can only hope that we can get something, but uh, there was a... Now, there is, yeah. let me just mention on the tax subject, uh, regardless of whether we do anything on, on comprehensive reform or not, there are important tax provisions that are scheduled to expire at the end of this year. I, I'm sure a lot of folks here are very focused on those. Uh, the production tax credit in particular uh, for wind energy it expires at the end of this year. The uh, tax credit for biodiesel, for cellulosic, uh, those, uh, those have been uh, helpful in, help in encouraging deployment of renewable energy around the country and unless Congress steps up and renews those once again, uh, they'll go out of existence. I think uh, I, would, I, would, I would think the chances of them being renewed are somewhat less than 50-50, but uh, they, they may well be renewed again. It's, it's hard to predict at this point. Now, and if you were to break that down between the House and Senate, do you think uh, the Senate, which you of course were part of and closest to, is which, does one have a greater chance of moving something forward and then the other one have to be blocking him? So which is, which is going to move and which is going to well, be Well, I think the, the model that we've just seen this week in the last couple of weeks with regard to immigration legislation, I think is, is one model that has a chance to succeed in, in this area as well and in any area. And that is if you can get a bipartisan agreement on legislation in the Senate, and pass it through the Senate with a good margin, a bipartisan vote, then, uh, then it goes to the House and, and hopefully the House will, will uh, follow the Senate's lead or come up, come up with an alternative that then can be conferenced and, and you can get to final legislation to send to the President. I mean, that's what's gonna, or that's what people hope will happen with immigration. Uh, I think that's the kind of thing that could happen with tax reform as well. If, uh, if you had a group, a bipartisan group of senators committed to a particular course of action. I think part of the problem is that, that uh, with regard to tax reform, we don't have very good consensus about what we want to accomplish with tax reform other than cleaning up the tax code. Uh, and, you know, on the Republican side, I think it's fair to say they don't want to raise any additional revenue on the Democratic side, they think we need to have additional revenue and uh, in order to uh, deal with the long-term deficit. And so uh, that's a major stumbling block as well. Right. And, and then we, when we deal with the various tax credits like biodiesel, cellulosic, renewables, uh, it, it is, is a fairly likely scenario uh, that is we get to the ending of the time, nobody's really made it, any decision, we go a couple months later, the pressure builds up and only, and we won't know until a couple months after they expire? No, that may be the case. That's what's happened in some, some previous years. This last year, of course, we had the, the uh, fiscal cliff was the big uh, uh, precipitating event that, that caused the Congress to go ahead and, and pass extensions of those particular tax provisions. But, uh, it, gave, it provided a vehicle that those tax provisions could be attached to. Uh, there's no similar precipitating event uh, looming uh, on the 31st of December of this year that I'm aware of. So uh, that, that perhaps adds to, the, uh, adds to the pessimism that I would have about us getting these extended again. So for those of us in the, those people in the room whose companies are very involved in those things, 
they have to be ready for some more risk bearing, right? I, I assume that's right, unfortunately. Yeah. I, I want to turn back to the president's announcement a little bit more. And what I couldn't understand from it um, is, is this all going to be all Washington action? Or to what extent are the states going to be involved or pulled into this, this process? Um, coming from a state that showed leadership here, is this, this going to be, do you think sort of the plan is going to involve, heavily involve the states, or is it going to be Washington top down? Or can well, you tell? Well, you know, I, I don't know, and uh, I, I think there's been a lot of speculation. I've seen some articles uh, just in the last few days about how saying that the president was picking up on <clears throat> suggestions that the NRDC made and in a report that they developed uh, that basically urged that the states be called upon to develop implementation plans and, and uh, essentially the urging that the states be heavily involved in whatever EPA winds up uh, going forward with. Now, whether, they, whether EPA chooses that route or not, I don't know. I don't think the president specified that that, that would be the case. At least I didn't hear that part of his speech. Uh, but uh, uh, I think there's a lot to be said for for trying to get the states heavily involved in the in uh, in achieving the greenhouse gas and, and carbon emission reductions that he's talking about. Uh, but whether EPA will choose to do that, I don't know. Yeah, everything. When I read things coming from the White House as well as the speech. Um, it wasn't clear that the word states was part of the vocabulary there. It was all what EPA and the federal government would do in the federal buildings and, and the efficiency standards and so forth. So um, I would hope that the states actually are pulled in by the EPA, because after all, that's where a lot of the impetus came from in the first right. place. Right. Um, can you comment on, do you have any thoughts about uh, the PACE program, the Property Assessed Clean Energy, that was one of those programs where, where um, it wasn't the states, it was cities that were, were uh, implementing uh, uh, financing of energy efficiency and clean energy. And then, then at the fed, federal government level, it was killed. The federal uh, housing finance agency um, said, no, we create risks. Uh, by doing that, by having instruments that will be superior to the mortgages. Any thoughts about whether there's either legislatively um, wanting to do something, or, uh, something that would legislatively or through the administration, doing something that will more facilitate those sort of programs to come back? Well, I think there's interest in doing a, a legislative uh a fix to that problem, but uh, in fact, I think there's a bill that's been introduced in the Senate and probably in the House as well. Uh, whether whether it proceeds or not, uh, I can't tell you. The uh, there is a chance, at least I'm I'm hearing that there's a real chance that the Senate will consider energy efficiency legislation uh, before the August recess, and uh, that would probably be start with the bill that. Gene Shaheen uh, from New Hampshire and Rob Portman from Ohio have put together, and uh, it's, it's a bill essentially that we reported out of the Energy Committee in the last Congress. It's been reported out again, and, and I think there's a real effort to try to get it to the Senate floor. If that happens, then some, something like a legislative solution to the PACE uh, problem uh, might be offered as an amendment to that. Uh, again, uh, you know, there's a lot of ifs in that uh, equation. But uh, it is possible that uh, you could find a, uh, a genuine effort to uh, fix it legislatively. And, and whether, the, whether the administration could get it fixed uh, without legislation, uh, I just don't know. Uh, I don't know if the president has the authority uh, or if this independent uh, agency, that the federal housing uh, finance uh, agency that you mentioned, uh, has enough autonomy to, to avoid that. Uh, how about the new leadership uh, in the Senate Energy Committee, uh, your, your successor? Tell us about your successor in that committee. Well, Ron Wyden, of course, Ron uh, also has, was, was a student here at Stanford and 
Uh, I wanted you to say that, yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, but he, uh, uh, Ron is the chair of the committee uh, from Oregon. Uh, of course, he is also in line since Max Baucus is, is leaving the Senate at the end of this Congress. Uh, Max uh, will, will be vacating the chairmanship of the Senate Finance Committee, and most people expect that at that point, Ron, as the, as the next ranking Democrat, would, would move over to the Finance Committee. So he, his tenure as chairman of the Energy Committee may be two years in length. Uh, but uh, I think he's trying very uh, heroically to get legislation to the Senate floor. Uh, we've never had great difficulty getting consensus to report legislation out of our Energy Committee in the Senate, but we've had uh, substantial difficulty getting it to the Senate floor and then getting it through the Senate and then getting the House to agree to it. It's part of the reason, uh, since, since your committee, bipartisan, gets things out, has worked it through, but, but it's a trouble getting the floor, is part of the issue that there's lack of understanding about energy issues on the rest of the Senate, or, or is it something different and more profound than No, that? I think it's different and more profound, and that is the general dysfunction that uh, has beset the Congress uh, in, in recent years. Uh, I think it's just the, the majority leader has difficulty moving legislation through the Senate unless he can get some bipartisan support for it. Uh, and. Uh, and there's not been a good cooperation between the two parties to, to, uh, to get legislation up and, and considered. As I think many people know, we've had a whole, we've set new records for the number of filibusters in the Senate uh, in recent years. And, uh, and that unfortunately continues. Now, now the success that, that the Senate had with passing the immigration bill this year uh, it may be just uh, an exception to that because of the political imperative that Republican members feel to, to get this issue resolved before another election. Uh, or it may be the sign of uh, uh, that, that we can get more cooperation in the future. I, as I say, the, the model that was used there, I think, uh, is a good one. And I, I hope it can be used uh, on energy legislation, on, on a variety of other uh, subjects in, in the coming months. I, I, I think that's an interesting way of viewing it, that it's improving it. Uh, from my cynical point of view, it's sort of like, I think it's sort of like saying, uh, right now we've passed the sol summer solstice, so the, day, the days are getting shorter. Well, they're still as long as they've ever been. It's sort of like the dysfunction is as great as probably has ever been. I mean, it's me as an outsider, I don't remember the dysfunction ever being this great. And do I have too short term a memory, or did it used to be worse, or is well, it Well, I, I, I have a fairly short. You've only been there 30 years. Yeah, over the 30 years I've, I watched it uh, closely. Uh, I think the dysfunction is as, as severe now as I've seen it. Uh, and, and it's particularly true when you get into budgeting and appropriating of money. I mean, that's where the dysfunction is most obvious. Uh, we have great disagreement between the, the two parties and the two houses of Congress on what levels of funding should be provided to different activities in the government. Uh, the, uh, it's almost certain that we will not get an appropriation bill or a set of appropriation bills again this year. We will have something in the nature of a continuing resolution to basically keep funding where, where it has been. And then there's, uh, there's also just great disagreement about how, how large the government should be and uh, how, much, uh, uh, how much revenue the government should be permitted to raise. In, in California, we have passed an initiative that said if, if the budget is not passed on deadline, at deadline, until such time as is passed, the members of the, of, of the legislature cannot get paid. Would that help in Washington, too, if we would get such a rule? I don't know. I, I, think, you'd, I think you'd have trouble getting that through the Congress. <laughs> <laughs> and we, would have, we did here, but we have the initiative process. Right, yeah, in, we in don't California. have a national initiative process. To... <laughs> maybe we should. Maybe. maybe. Uh, there's one thing that I'm always curious about, and you as an insider maybe can answer. 
It seems to be that among the Republicans in Congress, it's become a litmus test to not believe in climate science. It's not, it's not simply you don't want to do any bills, but it's to say, I don't believe in the science. It's a litmus test. What's the reality? Do, 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 do all of these reject the science, or is it uh, something different than that? Well, I, I believe strongly, and I've been saying now for some time, that I think most, most everybody in the Congress uh, is, is like most informed people around the country and the world and, and believes the science. Uh, but uh, I do think that the politics uh, for, particularly for Republican members, is such that they do not want to be in the circumstance where they're labeled as moderates. And uh, so, so in order to avoid that, they, they do not want to embrace any, any kind of a uh, governmental response to, to climate change, because that's sort of one of the things that would tip people off to the idea that they're moderates. Uh, and, uh, and the reason they don't want to be labeled moderates is because the next time they're running a primary, they of course would have a, an opponent who would say, I'm the true conservative in this race, and my opponent is a moderate. So, uh, in, in, particularly in the House, in a lot of the gerrymandered districts that currently exist for members of Congress, uh, that can be a, a, a very successful attack uh, to, to be able to claim that you're the true conservative and your opponent is, is in fact uh, moderate. So uh, I, I thought it was interesting this week when the president gave his speech on climate change, I didn't hear a whole lot of uh, people pushing back on the basis that there was no scientific grounds for the president making the, uh, making the claims and, and uh, setting out the agenda that he was setting out. I think the, the, the general critique I heard was uh, this is going to cost jobs. This is going to hurt the coal industry. This is going to hurt particular parts of the economy and uh, therefore we should oppose it. But, but that's, that's very different than saying you don't agree with the science. It sure is nice to be in a university where now that I know I'm a moderate because I believe in climate change is a problem, that it, we can talk publicly about it. Right. It's not just, you know, hidden. Um, okay, well, it's, it's at least too good to know that, that every time they say that they doubt the science, they actually are not quite telling the truth, at least they're well, not that, I, that doesn't, I'm not saying that's the case with everyone. <laughs> No, I, I can think of an example. <laughs> Jim Inhofe is a good friend. Jim Inhofe probably does not believe the science, the way uh, uh, he's written a book to that effect, I believe. And, and, uh, but I just don't think many people subscribe to his, his perspective on it. Okay. So let's go back to this general dysfunction um, uh, in, in Congress. If you were thinking about ways that you can start improving that situation, uh, that dysfunction. Uh, there are a couple of things that you would see that would be helpful in reducing that, uh, the dysfunction which you see there. Well, I think there are a lot of things that could be done. Of course, you can reform Senate to rules to make it much more difficult to filibuster, and, and we've, we've been trying to do that. Uh, that still has to, has to get done. Uh, I think that the the idea of having a nonpartisan or, or uh, non-elected group uh, set out the, uh, the, uh, the boundaries for congressional districts uh, to get away from gerrymandering is, is, a, uh, is a good, is a, a good uh, a policy initiative, and I know that's what's happened here in California. I think it, it would be a good thing to the extent it can. Uh, to have that uh, happening uh, elsewhere in the country. Uh, so uh, those are good. I, I think also the, the idea of allowing, at least allowing independents to vote in party primaries, uh, the party primary of their choice, uh, would be a good thing. In my state, uh, we, we still have the same system we've always had, which is if you're a Democrat, you get to vote in the Democratic primary. If you're a Republican, you get to vote in the Republican primary. But every year, every time we have an election, there are a larger number of people who are neither Democrats nor Republicans who are independent. And they are essentially disenfranchised in the choice of the party 
nominees for the uh, or for the office. So uh, I think allowing independents to vote in one in in whichever of the primaries they choose would help to ensure that candidates, whether Democrat or Republican, uh, tr try to stay somewhat in sync with the mainstream so that they can pick up some of those independent mm -hmm. votes. So there is hope. Well, I think there's some ways forward. Uh, you know, it's, it's not easy, and uh, I'm not saying anything's going to uh, correct itself immediately, but uh, I, think, uh, I think there are ways to make progress. And I was, frankly, very encouraged by uh, the way the Senate dealt with the immigration bill. It's, it's not a great bill. I mean, uh, there are lots of problems with it, but it's, it's substantially better than what we have today, and it is a... Uh, a major step forward that they could pass it in a bipartisan way, and as I say, maybe this uh, could be a, a template for the way way we proceed uh, uh, the rest of this Congress on some other things. I would hope so. There's a lot of people in the audience here that, are in parts of their career, that they could contemplate running for the Senate. What would you tell them? I'd say. Uh, Go have at it. It's a great, uh, it's a great, uh, well, I give them the same advice that uh, my former law partner who had been governor of New Mexico gave me when I was a very young uh, beginning lawyer. He said, uh, politics is a great thing to be involved in if you don't have to be. And uh, I think that's a good, uh, a good piece of advice. Uh, so uh, I would recommend anybody who wants to jump into it and doesn't have to, in order to make a living, uh, should be encouraged to. Yeah, and, and you've had a very, very successful, probably very gratifying career uh, in the Senate, and uh, presumably other people can do the same here, some of whom may be in the room right now. Well, good. I, I, hope, I hope people will, will make a run at it. and, and uh, uh, there, there is a lot you can accomplish in the Congress. I think you can accomplish less these days than was the case a decade ago, perhaps. But uh, that's that's not. I mean, that that's because of the general gridlock uh, that that has beset Washington. Now let me t um, turn back to a, just a general statement about energy policy. I often have people come up to me and say, we don't have any energy policy in the United States. Um, but you've been chair of the committee that sets energy policy. Do we have an energy policy? Uh, what, what would you say to those people who come up and say, we don't have any energy policy? Well, we, we have a lot of policies related to energy, and we have good consensus on most of the policies related to energy. The one area where we uh, have great disagreement uh, is on uh, how much the government should do to accelerate the transition to a less carbon intensive economy. At least that's, that's my perspective on things. I mean, wh wh that's, that's where the, the confrontation occurs in the Congress these days. When, when, you start, uh, when you start suggesting legislative actions that would accelerate that transition to a, a low carbon economy, you have uh, great resistance. So uh, uh, you have great advocacy, but you also have great resistance. And uh, so that's, that's where the, the country, I think, uh, lacks an energy policy. But on, on other things, I mean, I think everyone agrees we ought to have abundant sources of energy, that we ought to have uh, inexpensive energy to the extent we can, uh, that we ought to, consistent with meeting our environmental goals, uh, that uh, we ought to lead the world in science and engineering to develop new energy sources and to improve the use of energy. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of subjects like that, or goals that you can say we have consensus on. And, and I think uh, not just in the Congress, but in the country. And, and by the way, thank you for talking to my class. I, I had the pleasure of uh, having a 
Senator Bingaman talk with my class on energy and environmental policy and, and chat with them about whether the things I was telling them actually had any reality. I won't tell you what they learned from that. Uh, how about your future? What's next? Well, we're working on this uh, project that I described to you for the next uh, several months. Uh, we're hoping to get a report out uh, this next, uh, uh, early this next year or this next spring. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's the extent of my planning horizon at this point. Uh, my wife and I are back in New Mexico. We're living in Santa Fe and, uh, and uh, enjoy that very much. And so we have no real plans beyond that. Okay, let, let me just let, give the audience, everybody out here, a vast warning. In about a minute or two, I'm going to call for questions. So those with the microphones should be ready and we'll pull out. We'll have a few minutes that they'll, they'll have a chance for you to ask questions. Um, do you think now that you've left the Senate and you're going to be doing some writing with um, the Hoover Institution, as well as independently, that in some sense you have as good a platform to influence energy policy as you did in the Senate, or maybe even better, just different. Well, I think it's different. Uh, well, you know, what we're doing here uh, with with our project is trying to to uh, focus on what the states can do and have done, and uh, that that I think is a little bit separate from what's. Uh, what Washington uh, can do and has done. I think uh, in Washington, realistically, the Congress is not going to make major policy with regard to climate change and energy ho here uh, for the next year and a half, I would, I would su uh, suppose. But, uh, but as you pointed out, the president is, is, is now uh, on, on a path to getting significant uh, action from the administrative branch. And uh, I guess the, the question is, how are the states going to respond to that? How, the, how are the states going to be involved in that? And, uh, and I think we can be of help in, in coming up with suggestions. Good. Well, as, as my bias, as I started on my earlier comments, is much of these policies start at the state anyway. And just I like to think they start in California and roll east. Uh, good things as well as some bad things go at least. You know, we've had electricity crisis, which, which also, you know, shut down deregulation. But, but a lot of the things study. So I'm very pleased, uh, you know, that to to see work that'll be going on with the looking at what the states have been doing. At this point, um, I'd like to turn to questions uh, out here. And there's a question over there of whoever has a microphone. I saw, I saw a first hand up there. Just wait till you get the microphone, and he will be there quickly, right there. Thank you, Senator. And, so, and start with name and, and organization, but at least name. Hi, Carol De Benedetto, Lean Energy. Thank you for your insights. Um, I wonder, I'm really curious about your thoughts about campaign finance reform and improving dysfunction in, in um, our government and specifically relating to energy policy. So campaign finance reform, maybe even reversing the effects of Citizens United on energy policy. Well, I think uh, you know the Citizens United case uh, makes it very tough to do uh, meaningful campaign finance reform. The the exception, which I think most people think is still within the uh, authority of the Congress, even in, after Citizens United, uh, is to pass legislation requiring much more disclosure of who's doing the financing. I mean, we can't limit the funding because the Supreme Court said that's unconstitutional. But we can certainly do more to make the the source of the funding transparent, and uh, uh, I, I think there are some on the Republican side in the Senate who have indicated a uh, willingness to support that kind of a measure. I think Lisa Murkowski, who used to be, uh, who is still the ranking member on the Energy Committee, but and and was uh, while I was the chair in, in the last few years. 
Uh, I believe she co-sponsored some, some legislation here uh, just in the last few months that, that would, would require this kind of transparency. Uh, so that, that's, the, that's the one area where progress could be made. Uh, it, I'm not that optimistic we'll get it done in this Congress, but at least uh, there is some bipartisan support for doing that. Wait, there was a hand up there, the next green shirt there. I've got the microphone. The microphone will, oh, okay, you got the microphone. Well, you've got it next. <laughs> I'm Bill Betchert. I'm um, unaffiliated, um, but I'm participating in Citizens Climate Lobby um, on the topic of a, a carbon tax. Um, I'd, I'd like you to comment on uh, whether there's an advantage to uh, divorcing the, the carbon tax from the general comprehensive tax reform. Uh, specifically, uh, would you comment on the idea of a carbon fee uh, with all the proceeds distributed to the general population as a dividend? Um, this would be revenue neutral and might avoid the, the broader issue of uh, uh, size of government and increasing revenue. Well, I, I think obviously there's a lot politically attractive about uh, some, some type of proposal that rebates whatever revenues generated uh, to the, rebates that to the public. Uh, as a procedural matter, I think it's very difficult in the Congress to pass a carbon tax unless it's part of a larger uh, tax package. Uh, you know, taxes are, uh, whenever a tax bill comes to the Senate floor, there's, uh, there's a great desire to add provisions related to other, other parts of the tax code. And, uh, and I think that uh, the way the Finance Committee in the Senate and Ways and Means Committee in the House operate, uh, they're, they're not going to be supportive of trying to just do a one-off kind of, let's do a carbon tax, and then we'll also uh, do more comprehensive reform somewhere else. They'll want to have it all rolled together, I believe. Yeah, next. Yeah. And this will be the penultimate question. Hi, Senator Brad Coppathorn, Environmental Defense Fund. So I'm really interested in, your, in the project you said that you started working on. We are always looking for good state policies to uh, work on at EDF. And I'd love to hear from you if you've identified one or two of the most interesting state policies to support clean energy to date. Well, we, we have not uh, come to tentative conclusions yet. We're looking at the renewable portfolio standard laws that some 30 states have already adopted. We're looking at the energy efficiency resource standard laws that some 24 states have already adopted. Uh, we're looking at the, the laws that uh, quite a few states have now adopted that are focused on promoting uh, more, more distributed generation and particularly solar, uh, solar power distributed generation, uh, but we haven't reached conclusions that I could give you today. Okay, and the last question right up here is, uh, wait for the microphone and then we will bring this session to an end. Uh, yes, hi, Senator. I'm John Mizrock. I'm with right. the Council on Competitive. Right. It's good to see you. Good to see you. Um, I had the privilege of working with you for a couple of years, and uh, one of the many things that impressed me was the time you took to go into the detail of all the things that you were working on. The uh, question I have is a broad question. Maybe you can't answer it quickly, but um, so much has dramatically changed in the U.S. in terms of um, energy supply with oil and gas. Uh, with that change that is, I think, disruptive, how do we still keep the focus on deploying renewable energy and energy efficiency? Well, no, I think that's a great question, and, uh, and uh, I think we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna have that debate over the next uh, uh, few years. Uh, I, I agree with you, the, the newfound supplies of uh, shale gas, uh, in particular, shale oil, but uh, 
uh, more particularly shale gas with regard to power generation, uh, I think uh, do change that equation very substantially. It's, and, and again, I think a significant amount of the, the answer may be in the way that EPA chooses to, to formulate their, their regulation. We had a proposal that I introduced, and I think we had 13 co-sponsors for, for a clean energy standard where we basically tried to encourage uh, reduced carbon uh, from whatever source. And so there was, you could get a half credit uh, for going from coal down to, na to natural gas for, for power generation. Uh, you could get a full credit if you went to uh, renewable uh, power or nuclear power. And uh, I don't know if the, if the EPA will look at that kind of a formulation as, as one way that they might uh, try to uh, implement a rule, I don't know. But uh, it, to me, it made a lot of sense. It was the kind of a proposal the president had, in, had embraced in his State of the Union speeches for a couple of years in a row. Uh, so, uh, uh, but I think the, the answer to your question is gonna have to be decided over the next couple of years as the country settles on, on whether whether we're going to continue to aggressively pursue development of renewable energy or whether we're going to uh, basically take a powder and say, look, we've got all this uh, cheap natural gas now and we don't need to uh, concern ourselves to that great an extent uh, for, a, for a long while. So I don't know the answer. So all good things must come to an end, <laughs> including this session. So thank you so much for your insight and, and for the marvelous work you've done for the 30 years in, in the Senate and the marvelous work you're going to continue to do as you stay linked to Stanford. All right. Thank thanks. you. Thank you, Jim.